Hi, everyone, and welcome to Acumen's Webinar Wednesday. My name is Stephen Phelps, and I'm the Marketing Director here at Acumen. And today we brought in our very own Nick Nabasni to go over Stage 300 tips, tricks, and tools. Uh, in this webinar, we'll cover finder options, data entry shortcuts, user interface customizations, and other tools that can enhance your financial skills. Before we begin, please note that this webinar is in listen-only mode, and if you have any questions, then please write them in the chat option, and we'll answer near the end of the presentation. Uh, in addition, we are recording this webinar during a hurricane, so if, you if we have any technical difficulties, then we are going to be blaming it on that. So before we blow away, I will now pass it on to Nick. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, looks like the rain has uh, subsided for a bit here and, and has the wind, so hopefully we'll have no issues getting through this. Uh, um, good afternoon, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us this afternoon. I'm going to kind of flip between PowerPoint and Sage 300 so I can actually show you some of these tips and tricks in real life. So if you'll bear with me, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of flip through the PowerPoint in this view here so we can easily go back and forth. So let's go ahead and talk about some of our goals, right? So we want to make sure you're as comfortable as possible using Sage 300. And, and so over the years, our consulting team has put together uh, a list of these kind of tips and tricks, right? Data entry shortcuts, ways to navigate around the system that hopefully will help you save time and, and, and kind of be more efficient with your data entry. So there may be some overlap of some of the things you know today, some, some refreshers, and then hopefully there's a few things that you take away from today's session and uh, uh, kind of help you on a, on a day in and day out basis. We're going to go through those tips and tricks, those those data entry shortcuts in Sage 300, and at the end also kind of cover some of the tools that the Acumen team has put together to further enhance your Sage 300 experience. Please go ahead and uh, put any questions in the chat, as Stephen mentioned, and then we'll certainly make sure we get to those. Uh, Stephen's kind of monitoring that for us as we go through the presentation. <clears throat> okay, let's jump right into it. So the first tip, kind of trick, suggestion really, right, is working with multi-company functionality in Sage 300. Not every client on the line I see uh, has this, right, or has a need for this, but I see quite a few that, that certainly do. So let's kind of talk about a few things here that can make it easier to work with multiple entities. The first is the ability to customize the company dropdown. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is, is when you log into Sage 300, you can see a list of companies here, right, as you log into the system. And then the second tool is to modify the color scheme of each entity or each company so that you can uh, easily identify what you're working with or what entity or company you're in at that particular time. So in order to modify this dropdown, you can change a setting in an INI file, and we can certainly help you do this, right? Where you can see I cannot click on this dropdown until I enter my password, and then I can see all of the different companies that I have available because I'm admin, I have rights to all of them. If I switch to a user Nick like this and put in my password, you can see Nick, uh, same database, right? Same computer, same same uh, instance here, but I only have access to one of the companies. So that can make it a lot less confusing when you're dealing with, we have clients with six, 700 different entities in there, uh, just making sure the user can see the right ones. Now, of course, the old way, even if they see all of them, if they don't have rights to do anything in a company, they're still, of course, locked out of it. They can't do anything in it, but this can make it even easier to kind of find what you're looking for and navigate that. Let's talk about how we get there, right? How do we do that? Well. We want to be able to go first into database setup and you have to have the admin password to be able to do this of course but you need to make sure that you turn on security for your sample company system so there's two databases that make up each company a system and a company database 
and when you have the company, you want to make sure that you have security turned on for the application. So if I edit the system database in my sample company here, I make sure that I have security turned on. If you don't have security turned on at all, uh, this won't help you, but that is step one, make sure that you have security turned on. Secondly, you need to modify an INI file, which is just a text file that's out in the programs location where Sage is installed, and you have to change a setting. So to find where that file lives, if you go to help about Sage 300 and click on system info, the program directory is always listed here. So you can simply copy that path and go into Windows Explorer or launch the Explorer. And paste that path in, drag it over. And in here are all the programs that are installed and you're looking for a runtime file and you're looking for the a4w.ini file. You can open that with Notepad, WordPad, any text editor. And sorry, it keeps going on my other monitor here. And really at the top under the defaults here, we're looking for user authenticated list of companies. Uh, by default, that's set to a zero. So it will look like this when you first log in. And you want to simply change that to a one, setting that to on or yes, and saving that. What that will do for you is give you that result that I just showed. So when I log in as a particular user, once I put in my password, I can see any of the companies that I have security rights for. And so the security happens just like normal, no difference there. When you go into administrative services, you set up your security groups. So as the admin user, as I give Nick access to more companies, just by setting him up with security rights, he will see new companies in the dropdown list. Lastly, in database setup here, again, need to have the admin password to do this to get in here and, and make any changes in here. But you can see that you can set color schemes for different colors, for, for different companies, excuse me. You can assign them automatically or you can override them. So as you go into a particular company and you click on edit, you can go ahead and select any different colors. What's nice about that, uh, is as you're working in a particular company, you can see my blue bar at the very top here, but also all other windows will open with that same master color on the top. So you can easily identify if I have two order entry windows open for different companies or different IP uh, vendor uh, screens open for different companies, I can very easily tell what they are uh, visually. I can also always look at the code here, right? This is the company code or the database ID that tells me what I'm what I'm working with here. Okay, so that's how we work with multiple companies, uh, changing the colors for visibility, and then also limiting who can see what in that company drop down. Next, let's talk about moving through the system faster, right? We want to be able to quickly go through the system, try to leave the mouse behind because it's always faster to use tab to, to move through with the keyboard. So let's talk about kind of data entry shortcuts here as we move through the, the different screens in the system. And I'm just gonna maybe pick accounts payable just to, to go through an invoice and we'll talk about some of these. So we're gonna go with alt in the underlying letter. So if I hit the alt key on the keyboard and whatever underlying letter I have, that's going to allow me to very quickly jump to that particular section. It could be a tab, could be a close button, a print button, a file menu. Using the plus key in a numeric field will always open a calculator for me. Moving through the system with tab to move forward and shift tab to go backwards, and then also control tab to scroll through the tabs on a particular screen like a vendor invoice. So let's go ahead and go over to accounts payable here. Let's go to our invoice batch list here and we'll start a new batch. And I can do this on any screen, right? So we'll go ahead and pull up a vendor here. And if I hit the alt screen or alt key, excuse me, you can see that there are a bunch of underlying letters now. So alt F will launch the, the file menu. Alt A would add this entry. 
once I have something in the entry, of course, Alt P will post it. Alt C will close the window, right? So I can very quickly navigate through the through the screen. So Alt X will allow me to go to the taxes tab. Alt O goes to the totals tab. As I move through, I can uh, use the Alt and the underlined letter to again quickly navigate through the screens. As I use Tab to move through the screens. Uh, you probably do that on a day in and day basis. Uh, certainly the users that are on that are that are working with Sage Internet every day, but not everyone knows that I can also go shift tab to move backwards, right? And to go backwards uh, to move up to a field rather than reaching over and grabbing the mouse. If I've gone past something, that's a way to go backwards through that same tab sequence. The plus key allows me to open numeric fields here. So Anytime I am in a numeric field, such as the document total, the 1099 amount down here in the data entry grid that we call it, right? Anytime I'm there, I can launch the calculator in Sage by hitting the plus key, doing calculation, and I could do Alt P, right, to paste that value back in. Again, not grabbing the mouse and uh, kind of navigating with my, my keyboard here. Okay, then lastly, control tab allows me to scroll through tabs on a screen here. So you can see I have a few different tabs. The way they design the screens, right, are I have to really focus on the document tab. Most of what I need to enter is here, but control tab allows me to scroll through those and, and again, quickly kind of navigate through those particular windows or screens in the system as I'm doing data entry. A few more data entry shortcuts. As I'm working with specific fields, uh, the spacebar acts as a, a toggle, a switch, a yes, no, turn something on or off, check a box or uncheck a box. If you ever have, when you're doing payables and you want to pick payments to, to pay, uh, yes and no is, is, a, is one of the fields or one of the columns there. That's a quick way to do that. The function keys, F1, F5, F7, F9, doing the context sensitive health and launching the finder and refreshing on the zoom key, right? We'll cover those and, and just remind everyone what they do. And then lastly, I like to copy like data when I'm entering new information. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Pulling up an existing GL account, adding the new code to make it unique and then just changing the bits that are different. Perhaps everything's the same, as far as settings go, except for the account number and description. So I only have to change those values. Let's go take a look at that. So as I'm working with something like a payment batch list, and I start a new batch here, and we'll go ahead and maximize this. So we can see the whole thing. And I say, we'll select my vendor, right? And hit my go button. Well, I don't have to click the go button. I can always use um, F7 to hit the go button and refresh the screen. And then I have the ability to uh, pick individual invoices, right? I can go ahead and grab the mouse, but I can also use my keyboard and my space bar to say yes or no, right? I can also, as I'm tabbing through, I can select or unselect check boxes, right? So that the space bar acts as a toggle, allowing me to navigate uh, through those and, and switch those yes no's or those check boxes or those kind of on and off i'm sure everyone has clicked on the finder here to launch the finder tool in sage 300 but you can also do that doing f5 i'm sorry i have a brand new keyboard and i have to turn on my function keys now it's working as expected <laughs> so uh, f5 will launch the finder f7 does the go button as i said F9 does a zoom window. So if I want to open up a particular line on say an order entry order or a maybe a, a general ledger journal entry and I don't want to scroll across, I can zoom into it with the F9 key. Now copying like data, right? This is not anything earth shattering, but we see lots of clients entering new data, uh, new vendors, new GL accounts, as we said, and, and this is just a, a neat way to kind of pull up all of the settings that, that might be the same and enter them in, right? So let's hit the finder very quickly here and say, okay, we have account 1021 and 1020, 
two, three. So let's add 1024 here, which might be a new cash or cash equivalent account that we have, right? So I'm going to go ahead and pull up one that is similar because it has the correct normal balance already and the, the correct group and the correct settings here if I want maintain quantity or control accounts, right? So I go ahead and select that. And I'm going to go ahead and just make the bits unique that I want. And you can see, I'm not going to save anything to 1023, and it changes to an add button here. Maybe this is the bank account, Visa instead of MasterCard, but all of the other settings are there. They're all the same. I certainly can override things, but everything else, if there is anything that I need, has already been pulled through, and I can simply click add. So that's helpful sometimes. Right? It's helpful for maybe copying vendors that are similar, or GL accounts like this, uh, inventory items for those of you that are running the operational modules. I see that a lot. Pull up an item with all the category settings, the accounts, that's all that information, uh, and just change what what's different and what needs to be uh, needs to be modified. Next is our user interface, or what we call a UI customization, right? There are ways to modify the Sage 300 desktop to help users find things, to help users navigate through the system, especially when they're new to Sage 300. This can be a very powerful way to help users uh, get through what they need to do on a daily basis, especially if they're using like a a shipping clerk in the back that needs one or two buttons, right? One or two things that, that they go into every day. They may not need the entire access to the, the Windows Explorer like tree on the left-hand side. Let me show you what I mean by that. So with user interface customization, we can go in and say things like under administrative services, we have UI profile maintenance and a real life example that we've done for clients is on the vendor screen here you may want to go to vendors and say let's hide a particular field so we can do data entry faster or let's uh, perhaps hide a button like the delete button to provide an additional layer of security well, under the file menu here there is a an option called customize and what that is doing is allowing me to customize the user interface for whatever screen I'm on. So I have to have a profile, and this can be anything you want. It could be uh, CEO, could be controller level, could be module specific like I have here, AP users. What we're really gonna do is assign a user to a UI profile, right? So there's no right or wrong answer to what the profile is called. But once I go ahead and select that, what you see in the background, all of these checkboxes are actually all of the tabs, buttons, fields, finders on the screen behind it. So as I scroll through in our example of hiding the delete button, right, I can come down and find the delete button and actually hide that. The hardest thing to do is actually find it when everybody's watching you, but you can see if I uncheck that, I can actually take the delete button off the screen. So we've had clients do this on, say, order entry screens to take off maybe two or three fields that you don't ever use and you may never use, so why not take them off so it's faster to move through that process? We've had clients do that like this. I wanna give my users rights to add, modify vendors, but never delete a vendor in this case. Uh, perhaps we might wanna take off retainage or, or hide maybe address line four because we've keyed in something that's sensitive in that field and we wanna hide it from certain users. So. We did one real life example where we defaulted the checkbox to be on hold, right? And we hid this field from all users, except I think it was the controller in that case. And what she was responsible for was making sure they had all of their documentation together. So they were running um, one of the document management add-ons for Sage 300, and they would make sure they had the W9 and certificate of insurance and the contracts all signed, right? And only then would she take them off the hold by clicking save and, and, and she could see that field and other users couldn't. So even though they had rights to create new vendors, they were not able to do exactly what we just did there and take a particular vendor off of hold. Right? So that's the UI customization, UI modification. I like to start from the screen that I'm going to modify and then under administrative services, 
you can go ahead and assign the UI profile. So I can select individual users and assign a profile. So now when I log in as Nick, I would inherit this profile for AP and any of the user interfaces or screens, right, are, are, that are modified would show up for me. They would look that way from that profile. Let's take that out so I'm not missing anything there. And let's go ahead and move on to the next screen. Okay. Scheduling. This is something that has been in Facebook Center for a long, long time, as long as I can remember anyways. And uh, really, we don't see clients using it enough, in my opinion. And scheduling is part of common services. So if we go over to common services here and take a look at the scheduling section, there's two kind of important pieces. I'm going to cover both of them together by going into the schedules first. But we recommend create schedules for various recurring entries. So GL recurring entries, payables recurring entries, anything that you have going on, go ahead and create a recurring schedule for it. Now you may want to get creative with what you call or name a schedule, right? So that I, I might have monthly Nick, monthly Steven, because I might, and this is the important part that we don't see used enough, I might want the system to remind a specific user, maybe two or three days in advance of the schedule start date. And what's gonna happen is when I log in as Nick now, it's going to pop up that reminder list and say, it's time to process your monthly accrual. It's time to run your weekly payroll entry. It's time to post your uh, GL depreciation entry, time to run your recurring payables, right? Whatever that schedule is, it's going to pop up and tell you to do it. It's going to remind you to do it, which is nice. Certainly you can uh, come in and, and modify the schedules here, of course, and, and, and edit them. But using this kind of reminder is again making the system work for you a little bit and, and having it pop up and, and just uh, quickly actioned. So we don't see the, the reminders used nearly enough as we're working with clients uh, day in and day out. The next one is the ability to create multiple copies of the same icon. This one, I don't think everyone will have a need for, but when you do, it's a really nice feature to turn on and you'll see how easy it is to do. So when you open the properties of a particular icon by right clicking on it and going to properties, there's a checkbox to say start multiple copies. While we're in here, by the way, you can also change the name of an icon. So if you're helping a particular user and you want them to customize their desktop and name that, say Nick, click here to create orders, you can go ahead and change the title on individual uh, icons like that. Well, let's go ahead and say we might have a situation where we're working in order entry. And as I'm working through a big long order, someone calls and asks about the status of another order, right, or wants me to uh, modify something or edit something. So if I'm on order 70 here, right, and I'm working through, I, I hit my insert key to get a new line and I'm adding parts all, all day, I'm scanning them or manually entering them in, whatever the case might be, I'm working through this, right? And I get a phone call. If I minimize this and I go back to order entry, you can see it's just gonna open up the same order that I'm on. So I have to post it, uh, go off of it, come back to it, right, and, and, and kind of leave it there. But if, rather than doing that, if before I go into order entry, if I right-click and go to properties here, I can start multiple copies. And now what happens if I launch the screen, I get that same blank order entry screen. And if I'm working with an order here, I can go ahead and minimize it or even move it to the side. And when I double click again, I'm going to get a new instance of the order entry screen in this case. So here I might be working with an order number one or putting in a quote. I did it twice, sorry. Now I might be working with order number 69 and I also have order number 70 going. So depending on the size of your screen, you may not have want to have 
too many of those because you can end up with uh, 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 lots and lots of windows open. But you can see now I can leave this as is, just go ahead and minimize it, go ahead and look up the status of this order, check the totals, check, you know, whatever I have to do, ship it out the door. And so that's done, close it, and I'm just right back to the order 70 that I was working with here. Uh, that's still open for me. Okay. So start multiple copies can be used all over the place, different scenarios, general ledger entries, payables. Uh, we see it a lot like that with, with order entry purchase orders when you need to stop for a moment, look something else up and, and see what's going on. You can, uh, you can start multiple copies of the same icon. Okay, Sage 300 desktop, modifications to the Sage 300 desktop. This goes hand in hand with that UI modification, but it's another way to really help users uh, work with the system and, and navigate around. So if we customize the desktop, right, and you have to give a user security rights to do so. So it is part of security to allow a user to be able to customize their desktop. And what you can do is you can add things like custom folders. So maybe up at the top here, I'm going to right click in the new in the white space over here and I'm going to say new folder. And these are always alphabetical. So I always do dot dot and I put Nick and finish. If I did want this folder to be available for all users, if it was called month end reports or it was called uh, click here for the Excel uh, currency calculator we do, or the Excel import file, whatever it is, right? The Acumen tools, I can certainly create it for all users. Just note that if you do it for all users, it truly means every user in Sage, and if some user moves it or deletes it, it's linked to all users, so it's gonna be moved or deleted for all users. That's okay, you can put it back, but just be careful that that is, uh, it truly does mean all users. So I right click and say, I'm gonna create a folder, and now in here, our example of maybe a, a, a shipping clerk, right, who may work with um, transactions and, and ship them out the door. I'm going to go ahead and drag this over to my NIC folder and drop it in there. And perhaps they also print out packing slips or picking slips and drop that in there. Now, we've even gone so far as to drag this over and then take away their ability to. Uh, change their desktop or modify their Sage 300 desktop, and they can come into a very nice, clean screen like that. Now, in a folder or anywhere for that matter in Sage 300, I can also do things like new macro or a new report or a new program even. And in new program, I can launch Excel files. I can give it an ex uh, template. I can browse out to my Excel executable. Again, we can help you find that. It's just wherever your office is, is installed and you can browse to that folder. And the arguments are you fill in this certain Excel spreadsheet. So do you want a brand new Excel template or, or workbook to open up? Or do you want your uh, fixed assets Excel file to open up? Or do you want your commission calculations file to open up? Or one of the acumen import tools that, that we, you might work with, right? So you fill in those and you can have custom icons that launch other applications right from Sage 300. Again, just keeping the users kind of in one place, no need to jump around and uh, helps them to kind of navigate those things. So we've seen clients do neat things like web pages for uh, company intranet, uh, currency lookups, uh, vendor portals where you might have to to click in and log in and place the order once you enter it as a purchase order or something like that, right? So you can actually get in and, and do those kind of things here. As I said, if you go to properties, there's that start multiple copies, right? And here say Nick ship here, and I can go ahead and change the name of things, of the icons on the screen. I can even change backgrounds if I want to, getting a little bit fancy. Uh, I can go ahead and, and uh, um, kind of change the entire look and feel uh, in the background of Stage 300 if you'd like. One last thing about folders here. You saw me name that as Nick, right? And if I right click and do new folder and I call it startup, one word, startup, anything that I put in that folder 
is going to launch as soon as I launch Sage 300. So if I go ahead and say, uh, I'm in charge of maybe customer aging, right? And I'm gonna drag my age trial balance into my startup folder. So that's all I have in my startup folder now, right? As I log into the system, I have a restart record, but the age trial balance report launched right away. So this is a neat way if there's something that a report you need to run or even that takes a little bit of time, you can have it pop up immediately as you log in, uh, click it running, go grab your coffee, whatever you need to do, right? Launch your Outlook, log in, get, get ready for the day, and you can have it uh, run right away. So, or sometimes they'll put in icons that they work with every day. So I'm, I'm the order entry person, so I'd like that to open up as soon as I log in. So if it's named startup, like that, anything that's in there will be launched as soon as I log into Sage 300. So just a little neat trick on how to uh, work with those custom folders. Next are visual process flows, and it's, it's nothing more than another way to work with the screens, but it's very visual, it's very popular with clients that, that do end up working with them. But for clients that have been on it for a long, long, long time, uh, they're so used to the other classic desktop or the classic screens that, again, we don't see it used enough, in my opinion. So let's kind of talk about what those are, right? So the visual process flows, minimize some of these things here so we can see it on the bottom, are kind of pictorial representations of the, the modules we were talking about above, right? So accounts payable has the same kind of thing, enter vendor invoices, make payments, what reports do I want to have for transactions, for analytical reports, uh, what are my inquiries available. What I really like about these is, right, these are, of course, links, so I can click in, I can get to vendor records here, which is the same as going to AP and then vendors, right, same, same thing, nothing new there, but I can give, this is another way that I can limit rights for a user. So maybe I give them rights to accounts payable and they can run all of the reports, but perhaps I only want them to see the check register and maybe age payable. So in the visual process flow, I only give them rights to say those two reports, right? Even though behind the scenes they have others and I might do one of these things where again, I, I lock them down and the ability to kind of change their desktop. Now I can right click on these and just like we edited our desktop, I can go in and edit these and change backgrounds, add new uh, new buttons, make the process kind of flow as, as complex as I want, add other tools. Again, external uh, files, external programs can, can be brought into these visual process flows again. So uh, they, they did a really nice job kind of laying this out and, and kind of allowing you to customize it and, and make it your own. Again, uh, nothing different as far as functionality goes from what you have in the classic desktop, but again, another way to allow users to work with the system that they might find a bit more user-friendly or a bit certainly more visual, right, and, and kind of walk me through what our, our process is. Next, I want to talk about some of the finder options. So of course, we launched the Finder before. We talked about using the F5 key to, to open that in addition to clicking the magnifying glass. But some people we've seen that they're not aware that you can go in and change some of the Finder options so that you can find things in Sage 300 in different ways. You can search by different indexed fields or keys. You can change the columns, include different columns, change the colors, change how it searches in certain scenarios. So let's go take a look at that and say, maybe we'll work with our vendors again here, right? And we'll go ahead and launch our vendors screen. And we're gonna maximize this and then just go ahead and hit our finder. So I clicked on the magnifying glass, but you can certainly hit F5 to do the same thing we're gonna do here. And the finder settings are all up at the top here. So I can change the key. If I'm always searching by 
the vendor's short name or the group code and, and that's my primary search maybe i want to change those i don't see that being done as often as, as the next step here where i'm going and actually editing what is available uh, to search with right because anything that you store in sage 300 should be available in the finder if you don't see it you can launch the finder and go to settings and columns and you'll see that everything is available including optional fields way down here at the bottom uh, that i can move over so the vendor class the ups zone uh, temporary vendor purchasing representative notes those are all optional fields in my sample database that i can include or exclude and then i can certainly come over and move them up or down and that's just kind of changing the columns and, and changing their order so once i select everything i want I can go ahead and also, again, drag things around. I can resize columns to make sure that I'm, I'm seeing exactly what I need. Now, there's also a, a set criteria button, which um, m many people may not ever click on because you just go ahead and say, I want to sort or search by vendor name and contains, and I'm looking for modern design. So I'm going to do modern, and there we go. There's my modern design, and I go ahead and select them, right? But what I can also do is come in and say, let's set some criteria here. Perhaps I work with vendors that are in a specific state or province, right? And, and those are the ones I work with all the time, or vendors are in a certain group code, and those are the ones I work with. So let's go ahead and hit that finder again and look at some of those group codes and say, okay, I have INV, some inventory, I have some service vendors here, right? And maybe I'm in charge of the service vendors. So I might wanna to go to set criteria and I might say group code and click add to add it into the columns here where I can put my criteria in. And I'm gonna double click to open this cell. And I'm gonna say, in this case, I want it to equal uh, SVC. Or maybe I, I want it to say, give me everything that doesn't equal inventory, right? Or whatever the right answer is you can go ahead and, and build some complex uh, formulas in here. But I'm gonna say, I work with the service vendors, so go ahead and show me just the service vendors, and I'm gonna click Save and OK. And now you can see that the list has shrunk. When I open my Finder now, I'm doing this just for me. All of these settings are saved by user. So even if I logged in on Steven's computer, as long as I log in as Nick, or the admin in this case, right? I'm logged in as admin. Uh, I will see it exactly the way I left it. So I'm not changing anybody else's finders. Now you can, behind the scenes, copy files that will copy these settings to other users. So you can replicate this on a larger scale if you want to, but these individual user changes are not uh, changing anyone else but your own. So again, a little thing that if I'm working with the vendors from A to uh, J, I could do that. I can do just a, a certain group code. Maybe I want to hide inactive vendors from the finder or working with clients just in the state of California or something like that, right? So you can go in and set the criteria. They're never gone, right? The worst that can happen is I say, oops, I made a mistake. I want to clear all and save it again and say, okay, and I get everything back uh, immediately. So nothing's gone. I can just choose to select how I want to find things. And then last thing, you can go in and set uh, individual colors for different columns. So if you want to highlight the vendor number or you want to say the vendor number, the background color will be yellow, something like that. Say OK. I can go ahead and kind of, again, make it a little bit easier to see certain areas or make things pop out like that so uh, the users can find them. Okay, let's go to the next section is tweaking some of the reports and, and not really running the reports, but a few of the settings that can make running the reports easier and ways to maybe uh, save some of the settings so you can build some quick and dirty custom reports by saving some of the filter settings and, uh, and, and kind of how you export to Excel. Let's kind of talk about that and 
And then lastly, of course, that, that printer destination, right, and, and changing how I print something. So let's go ahead and take a look at something that's a report here. <coughs> and we'll look at our age payables report. And we'll go ahead and open up the age payables report. And as you might be familiar with, because I'm sure lots of you on this call today run this report all the time, you can go in and select different vendors by, you can sort by all of the different fields that are available, right? And so again, going back to that, if I work with the services group, I can say, I want the vendor group services to services, and I can say print and run this report and get only the service vendors. Now, wouldn't it be nice if I didn't have to do that every time because every time I come in, I'm only looking for the services vendors. So you can, you can go to settings and save settings as default. Now, when I come back into that same screen here, into that same report, I have those settings saved for me. So I may just change the date if it's moved ahead, right? And uh, I can uh, just run the report again. We've even seen some clients do some pretty neat things like go back in here, let's say, uh, let's, let's clear those, right? Maybe I, maybe I made a mistake or I don't, I don't wanna do that anymore. I'll go ahead and clear the save settings and they just go away, so that's, that's okay. You can also copy these icons, right? And, and paste them and make another copy of it. So now I have two age payables. And remember what we did earlier, we went to properties and I might say, I want age payables for the services vendors here. And now I'll go into this one and save it over here. And then maybe the next one I save as the uh, inventory vendors, right? For the INV and settings, save settings as default. And now I can just click on a services vendor age payables or something like that, or age payables in California or anyone uh, sorted differently, right? One in summary, one in detail, uh, one showing the applied payments, one that doesn't because you want a shorter version of it, right? All those kind of fun settings. Uh, so go ahead and, and launch some reports and, and check those settings. And, and then when you do, if you want to, you can certainly save the settings and always clear them as you said, right? But up here, check and see if you wanna save those settings. When I work with a particular report and I want to dump it out to Excel, maybe a vendor transaction report or something like this, I might run this report and print it to screen for now because I like to see what I get before I export it. <clears throat> but when you dump out to Excel, and again, there's probably lots of people on the call that do this on a regular basis, there are a couple little things uh, that I find are helpful to run when we do this, right? So it does a, a pretty nice job of dumping the data out to Excel, but you may wind up with a few extra columns or you may not want all this header information and stuff like this in, in, that, in that certain scenario, right? So when I go ahead and click on the export to my report here, or, or export to Excel or PDF or whatever I'm doing, in this case, we're specifically talking about Excel. One thing that's overlooked sometimes is this option here that is called data only, right? And the data only option is going to strip off all of the headers, the page numbers, the column headers, all of that kind of stuff, and allow me to just have some uh, row data or, or raw data that sometimes in certain scenarios, depending on what you're trying to do, is easier to work with. So that's the first thing I wanted to mention. And then the second thing is this destination. So if I select disk file and say, okay, it's gonna browse and, and allow me to pick a spot to save this, right? And that's fine, I can go ahead and do that. If I select application and now run it, <clears throat> it's going to launch Excel for me right away, dump that report into Excel and off I'm going working with it already. I don't have to now browse and find it and open it up and sorry, it's of course, went on my other monitor here, but now I can see I have <clears throat> everything kind of dumped into one spot. Oops, I made everything too big, sorry. But everything's in its own cell here. All of the page numbers, the headers, everything 
uh, all that extra stuff is, is kind of gone now, right? And I'm really only left with my columns that are important to me. Okay, so give that a shot. Certainly when you're looking at different kinds of reports, exporting different things, trial balances, financial reports, uh, all work this, the same way as well. And kind of dumping that information out to Excel. And then the last thing about printing <coughs> is the ability to change your print destination, which I'm sure lots of people have done. But there's a couple of different ways I can do that. I can go up to the top here and click on print destination, and I can choose printer or file or email, right? But I can also see my print destination setting down here on the bottom right above your clock, and I can see that it's currently set to preview. If I double click on that, I can get to that same uh, settings window that we just saw. So if I wanted to email something to someone, I can go ahead and set it as an email and say, okay, and run the report. And it's gonna launch a brand new email for me and allow me to go ahead and send that out. Now, that, that is, is nice. There are other options that are sometimes better for mass emailing, of course, when I'm doing a bunch of invoices or I'm doing checks and I'm using print boss and those kind of things. So just that's kind of a one-off type thing. I'm, I'm emailing a report to a boss or something like that. I don't have to save it first and then open up an email and attachment. I can do it again in one step. Okay. All right. Notes is a is a, a relatively new feature. It's been around for a few years now, but uh, uh, it's something that may or may not be turned on in your Sage 300. So if it's not, certainly uh, let us know and, and we can have one of the support team or one of the consultants get it turned on for you if it's something you'd like to use. You probably saw it pop up when I was working with that vendor, but you can have notes or vendors, customers, and inventory items. So as I pull up something <clears throat> that has a note, you can see it pops up next to me. So here's a note that could be time sensitive. Let's go and edit this so I can see what's going on. This is our primary vendor for inventory purchases. Perhaps I want it to only be active on certain dates. So maybe this customer has a sale <clears throat> or special pricing. Or maybe you don't want users to be able to dismiss it. So you can have as many different notes as you want about a particular vendor, again, about a customer, uh, about an inventory item. That's, that's a, a canned, uh, feature of Sage 300 that we can just turn on and you can turn on and then it will work with customers, vendors, and items in the Sage 300 system. Global search is another uh, feature that over the last few years Sage has added in. So I know there's lots of clients that have recently upgraded. So this is something that you may be able to take advantage of now. Uh, we're you're looking for information across maybe multiple modules and you're looking for a value and you can't find it, um, you can certainly kind of refine the default behavior by doing things like quotation marks or a plus sign to add multiple searches together, right? But let's take a look at, at how we use that. So that is located up here in the ribbon on the very right-hand side, it's called global search. And when I open up global search, I can go ahead and decide, okay, do I want you to look through everything, through all transactions or just payables transactions or just payables invoices, right? I can kind of control what I want it to search for. And I can say, okay, let's go ahead and look for something like 1200 here. And I can see, okay, so in batch number eight, entry one, I used vendor 1200 and I did in several other different batches. In this case, I have different payments, so uh, pages, excuse me. So as I flip through, I can see there's a GL account number 1200. There's a customer 1200, right? So it's gonna look across all of those different modules and find 1200 in this case, or find uh, a description that I've entered in or something along those lines that I'm searching for. So uh, it, it does a nice job of that. It's not 100% perfect, uh, uh, but <clears throat> it has, it's certainly a, a nicer way than, than you've had in the past to kind of find things where you had to go module by module or perhaps run reports out to PDF and then search in there for those kind of things. So that's global search up here in the ribbon on the top right hand side of the screen. Oh, 
Okay, so that kind of wraps up the Sage 300 tips and tricks portion. And I just want to spend a few minutes now on some of the various tools that the Acumen team has put together to give you some uh, enhanced ways to work with data, whether you're importing data, whether you're pulling reporting tools out, you want to have more dashboard-like experience with Sage 300 uh, and, and kind of get a bit more visual with your report. So I'm just going to flip over and kind of talk about a few of those things. There, you may be, again, using some of these tools. Uh, if, if you're not and are interested, certainly reach out to your account manager and they can set up a demo demonstration for you, get you a trial key so you can test it out and, and see what, the, what it might do for your company. So the Acumen tools are all Excel-based tools and they allow me to do imports to the system. We have about 48 of them now. And there may be even, we may have even hit 50 now. So just about everything you can do or enter into Sage 300, we've, we've built a tool for now. They are multi-entity. So if I was to enter, in this case, a journal entry and I wanted to cross two or three or 10 different companies, right? I certainly can do that. And they're neat because they're Excel based. So you might go in and say, okay, I want to, on this tab, I wanted to calculate a loan schedule or calculate a depreciation value, calculate an accrual, right? And then just use formulas to pull the data, the data in here. And then I can see, make sure it's in balance. And when I'm ready, I can go ahead and import this back to Sage 300. I can launch binders to pull in things like GL account and make sure that I'm using an, an active account, right? So leveraging Excel and the power of Excel and all the neat things you can do with Excel, like those calculations, templates, those kind of things, formulas, right? And then pushing that data back to Sage 300. So the clients that use these, we see them kind of working in them all the time, especially when you have multiple entities and doing those kinds of, of transactions. So uh, just a few other quick examples. Here's another GL journal entry tool where we might be calculating salary accruals, right? And say, okay, for this particular period, we need to uh, accrue for seven days. So it changes the amount because we have formulas, right, in Excel. And then it just, everything is brought through on this tab. And what, what's neat about it is as I copy things down, right, it's gonna go ahead and pull all the information in. So if I had just formulas built in and as I added new people and they come out here on my salaries report, uh, it will just pull them over to the tab, make sure that everything's updated. I can review it and go ahead and import it into the system. Bank transactions, getting data into multiple banks, maybe again, perhaps crossing entities. I got to post a deposit or an interest charge for 10 different companies across the system. Uh, you can do that in a single place. I don't have to log in and log out of every Sage 300 database to do that. And here's an example of, of two different ones, Sample Company Inc. and Sample Company Limited. And then lastly, budgets, right? Budgets is a big uh, popular topic, especially this time of year. People are starting to do budgets for the next year. And uh, uh, a very simple way to work with your budget, do calculations, use Excel to, to do all of that kind of heavy lifting for you, right? And then set the budgets in here with formulas, bring everything in and go ahead and import it into Sage 300. Which budget set is it gonna go into? That's gonna go into 2024 budget set one, right? And, and you, if you have five different budget sets per account per year, of course, and, and so you can select any one of those and import it up to Sage 300. Okay. So again, there's about 48 to 50 of those now for things like vendors, purchase orders, uh, bank transactions, just about any kind of data entry you can think of in Sage 300. We have ways to, to make that more efficient for you. And then the very last thing before you open it up for some questions, Stephen, is I wanna just mention and talk about uh, our Kind of newest tool and we've started to leverage the use and the power of Microsoft Power BI to bring dashboards, visual reporting 
to the Sage 300 workspace, right? So uh, we've our our kind of uh, reporting team at Acumen, our, our reporting department, has used things like Power BI now to pull in different kinds of statements that can be interactive, right? And these are just samples for a, a fictitious crane company that we've worked with. But uh, I may want to go in and look at different years, right? And, and pull data in and, and kind of go to different months or, or look at different actuals. I might want to look at one or two different entities together and see how they are in a consolidated format, right? Uh, maybe pulling in a balance sheet again, and I want to look at different periods. Neat things are I can go ahead and click on individual accounts and have the, the drill downs at the bottom change, right? So as, you, as I clicked on accrued payroll, here are the transactions that make up accrued payroll. And we can even have drill downs back to Sage 300 if that's something you'd like or, or would want to do, uh, drill down even further, right? But they're interactive, which is really nice. So I can click on things, it changes and, and allows me to find information a heck of a lot faster than, than running all kinds of different things. So with this tool, we can push information up to the Power BI site. It's all web driven. So I can do this on mobile devices. I can do this on web pages and I can um, just get that information exposed to certain users as, as need be. Uh, running an AR aging, right? <laughs> and clicking on certain groups uh, I'm not doing very good of collecting my aging here in my sample company. Everything's over 90, but maybe I want to look at customers that are just on hold or on hold or, or not on hold, right? Maybe I want to look at inactive customers so I can go in and really interact with the report and see here for Excello, what do they owe us? What's the breakdown of that? Okay, here's a crew and here are the three invoices that, that make up that $110,000 balance. So, Again, just a new tool that uh, our team has put together to add some visual reporting, some dashboards to the Sage Internet experience, uh, starting to roll it out to customers. It's been uh, highly asked for and uh, something that's been, been pretty popular. So something that you'd like to, to try, to, to have a test of, just let your account manager know and certainly can get that set up for you. So thank you very much for uh, spending some time with me this afternoon. Stephen, let's go ahead and see if there's any questions that I can help answer. Yes, at this time, we have a few minutes. Um, if you guys wanna write your questions in the chat or question option, uh, we'll read them out loud and answer. Uh, the first question that came in, it says, uh, how do you turn off notes in Sage 300? How do you turn off notes? Yes. Um, you can have notes that can expire. I've opened up way too many things here. So I can go in, I can delete notes. I can also have notes that expire if I want to, or we can even behind the scenes, we could go in and actually turn off that entire uh, I'm going to call it a module. It's not really a module, but we can turn off the notes application if you want it completely gone. So I'm not sure if I answered that exactly the way you're looking for it, but, but feel free to shoot us a note and we'll certainly have a, a consultant jump on with you and see that specific use case if we can help any further and on what you're looking to do. Perfect. Thanks, Nick. Um, another question that came in says, uh, will this recording be made available? So we do record our webinars. Um, they it will be on our YouTube channel probably by Friday, um, which is it's youtube.com slash acumen FL. Um, but if you want to get a link to the recording, uh, I would just shoot your account manager an email um, and then we'll send that to you as well. Um, another question that came in uh, was mentioning uh, the cost of the tool of reports for BI. Okay, uh, reach out to your account manager for that uh, because there's a couple different pieces depending on the modules you have, but certainly can get you pricing on that. Uh, it's a subscription-based price and uh, there's just a couple of variables that we need to answer, how many users, things like that, and we'll certainly get you a price on that. Thanks, Nick. Um, since, since it's uh, at that hour, 
uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up. So if you guys do have any additional questions, uh, please reach out to your assigned account manager or email us at am at acumenfl.com. Uh, we do have a few more webinars coming up with our account management team, along with time and attendance with Manusonic and Sage Fixed Assets. Uh, so please be on the lookout for webinar invitations. Uh, with that, I just want to say thank you again, for uh, Nick, for the tips and tricks. And we look forward to seeing you guys on our next webinar Wednesday.